Good morning, Shiloh Ranch Church. Good Mary, morning. How are you? I'm doing well. I was just checking my microphone. Yeah, I always tell people you need to be a fist's distance away. What if, hear me out here, your fist is bigger than my fist? I figure that's an okay margin for error. Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. N now that I'm close enough to the mic and not too far away, how's it going? How was your week? Week was good. Good. Yeah, um, today it's sunny, which is cool. I know, it's kind of nice. It is kind of, I felt the mm -hmm. sun and I was like, wow, that's, that's what that, that feels like. good. Yep. Yeah. Where is the, what's the weather like where you're watching from? Where are you watching from? Who are you watching with? How's it going? How's your new year? Let us know in the comments. I want to know all of that. We've got a in-person prayer team mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And I say in-person because they're physically here and they are ready to pray for you. All you have to do is click that request prayer button and mm -hmm. you get put into a separate chat room where you can just talk to them talk to and kind of, you know, share, share what you need. Yeah. And if you're watching on Facebook and you're not sure about the button we're talking about, you're going to want to head over to our other online platform. Um, there will be a link in the comments for you. So head over there. There's lots of different, um, cool things such as the prayer room, a notes section, a Bible section, um, and a whole other community that you guys may not even know of. So head over there. Definitely. So we are about to go into worship, yeah. um, stand or sit mm -hmm. wherever you're at and worship along with us. Yeah, and we'll see you guys after. Rock of ages, cleft from me. Let me hide myself.
Father, I just love the simplicity of those words. That we surrender all to you. God, the things of this world that we've clung to to bring us peace and love and comfort, and they've all failed us. So God, we just surrender all to you because you are the ultimate giver of peace and love and comfort. We love you. Amen. All right, you guys, we are back. We're about to head into the sermon. And what are we learning about today? Wouldn't you like to know? Yes, I would. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it is an archive sermon mm -hmm. of Jordan um, when we were, I mean, peak COVID stuff. When COVID oh, okay, was first yeah. going crazy. This is that. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a fantastic series. And I, I yeah. loved it. So. I found that when we bring these archived sermons back up to the surface and revisit them, I feel like they apply even almost two years later, essentially. Oh, yeah. um, and so it's just always cool to see that. And it's cool to know that I've heard about, heard it before, but just hearing it in a whole different way and a whole different perspective is awesome. Well, so. yeah, and th that's exactly right. You're hearing it from a different vantage point, from a yeah. different perspective. So y you apply it to different things mm -hmm. in your life. Um, and sometimes, I mean, I go to YouTube and mm -hmm. just that's go to random sermons. Mm -hmm. Um, to watch archives on my own time. So. Yeah, so you guys can head to our YouTube channel. Just search Shiloh Ranch Church on YouTube, um, and you can always rewatch old sermons, old services as a whole. Um, it's a really great tool to revisit. Definitely. So take notes. Yeah. You can always reach out if you have questions or if you want an explanation mm -hmm. um, expanding on a topic. Yeah. Um, reach out because we can, you know, answer those. Yeah. So. We're going to do that and then worship, and then we'll see you guys after that. Yeah, here we go into the sermon. So we have got a hurdle. We've got a hurdle. Before we even start, I'm going to address the, the elephant in the room. The hurdle is this. I'm not sure if I can explain what I want to explain today in a way that makes sense. Like that's, a, that's a great way to start a sermon. Um, we're in week two of a series about the advantages in desperation. And, and what I mean by that, I'm not saying that everyone who's desperate has a greater advantage. I'm not saying that advantages and disadvantages don't exist. Don't, don't take it as that. I'm saying there are times when we get to a place in life where we become so singularly focused because of a sense of desperation that we see something that we would have missed. That there are times where God in all of his sovereignty brings us to a place where we go, God, this isn't what we wanted. This isn't what we would have chosen. And God goes, I know that's why you're here. And I think it's our job as, as followers of Jesus and as people who are pursuing a life that reflects the gospel to go, hey, wait a minute, I'm noticing something here. I'm noticing a pattern. Sometimes God gives you advantages that only desperation will allow you to see. And so it, it seems like sometimes, you know, it doesn't, maybe you'll understand what I'm talking about. Sometimes it feels like there are two worlds. There are two worlds. There's the world that we watch there's the world that we listen to. There's the world that performs. There's a world that gets projected. That's the first world. And then there's the second world. And the second world is the world that we live in. And the world that we live in seems kind of ordinary or kind of common. It's just, you know, regular people, people that you see on the streets. And it's like we, we turn on the news, which I wouldn't recommend. But if you turn on the news, you see the world that we watch. And then what happens? You walk out your door into the world that you live in. And it's so easy to separate those concepts and feel like that the world that you watch never interacts with the world that you live in. There's two worlds. And this isn't even just about money or not money. This is, this is so much bigger than that because uh, Chris and I were talking about a second ago. There are people who are so talented. They're so talented, but they don't live in a world with wealth. They live in a world of talent. And then there's people who live in a world of wealth and they have no talent. And it's like, no matter where you are, there's always this perception, well, the other people live this way. Well, other people live this way. And we always are, are projecting an assumption about the world that we watch. And then we are experiencing the world that we live in. I, I told you we had a hurdle. I hope this is making sense. Let me, let me put it in a biblical sense. And, and hopefully we can understand the problems that can begin to arise if we don't recognize that we have this concept of two worlds. Okay, okay. John chapter one. First of all, thank you for being in church. Thank you for watching online. Thank you for bearing with us as we sort of wrestle through this hybrid concept. Thank you for being in church. 
and mostly, and mostly, thank you for letting what God is teaching all of us land. And I know that sounds really cheap. I know that sounds like a, a Sunday school thing, but if you will, if you will let the word of God land, regardless of how you heard it, whether you heard it live, whether you heard it through a screen, whether you're hearing it in a podcast app, God will speak to us in a way that will make life make sense. That's why we're so excited about this platform. Okay, here we go. Straight out of the word, John chapter one, verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Verse 45, Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Now, we've probably heard those words. Can I just make sure to draw a little bit, a little bit of attention to this one point? Philip is telling Nathanael, we found the Messiah. Now, we know the story of Jesus. Try not to skip ahead. Try not to be the curse of knowledge that goes, I know, I know where the story goes. Try to just put yourself only strictly in Nathaniel's shoes for a second. He is saying this. He is saying we found the Messiah. We found the Son of God. We found the one who speaks and the world obeys. We found the one who holds the world in his hands. We have met the man who is God in human form. Do you realize the mouthful of what Philip was trying to express to Nathaniel? And sometimes it just feels like the words, you just don't have the words. I'm kind of having a morning like this myself you just you have this big concept and you're trying to put it into words and he's like I think I found God God Moses prophets I think I think he's over here and listen to this listen to this they're saying I found a God in human form the God that could not be limited and Nathaniel says this because Nathaniel like us he lives in two worlds there's the world he watches and the world he lives in he says Nazareth can you think good come from there Do you, do you see what just happened? Nathaniel goes, God, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't indicate that he was doubting that the Messiah would eventually show up. He'd probably heard about the Messiah his whole life. Every time he was around somebody who had anything to do with the temple, Messiah, 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 the Messiah would exist in the world that he watches. The Messiah couldn't possibly exist in the world that he lived in. Do you see the distinction? He didn't doubt that the Messiah would be amazing. His doubt was found in the fact that that it was in the world that he was, that the Messiah was appearing in the wrong world. He didn't doubt that the Messiah was awesome. He was doubting that he would come here. He, Nazareth? He wasn't doubting that it was God. Isn't that crazy? Like the hardest concept of the Messiah he could believe, what tripped him up was that he doubted God could overcome an ordinary origin. I love Philip's answer because Philip's like, I think I found God. And he goes, I don't think he can come from Nazareth. And Philip was like, come, come see. <laughs> That's what he says. You, okay, you come and see then. I found God. I don't think he could be from that town. That's the part. That's the part that trips you up, where he's from. What Nathaniel is demonstrating is this. The bias, how deeply the bias in our own life goes. How deeply held the bias of advantage and disadvantage goes. We as people are prone, we are taught, it is reinforced to believe there are advantages and disadvantages and only advantages produce good results and disadvantages produce poverty and sickness and sadness and so it depends on where you're from. You have to be from the right side of the tracks. And I know that seems severe, but that is the depth of which bias of advantages and disadvantages go. His knee jerk was that the Messiah could overcome anything except ordinary. He could not overcome human disadvantage. We think of ordinary as the world that we live in. We live in an ordinary world. We watch an extraordinary existence. We watch extraordinary people. We watch amazing people do amazing things, but we live amongst the ordinary. We think of ordinary as being uninteresting. I mean, we are, I'm, I'm guilty of it. We're all guilty of it. We meet people. We, it's not like we walk into the gas station. We're like, oh, hi, hi. Like we get so used to just, it's just people. It's just the people that we live around. You know, you see kids in school all the time, oh, I can't wait to get out of this town. Why? Because we think of the world that we live in as being uninteresting, maybe insurmountable, maybe a disqualifier. Pause. Yep. Yo, what does that look like? What does that look like? It looks like every four years in the American culture. 
every four years, we don't think of the world as changing because of our participation. We don't think that we could make an impact. We don't think that the people that we live around could actually change the world. What? We want someone from that world. We need a hero from the world that we watch to rise up from advantage and from extra powerful positions. And that's the person, that's the person that's gonna make everything better. And, and we buy into it every four years. There's gonna be a hero and he's gonna solve our problems. You think about the, the woman at the well, this is all set up. We're still at the setup. The sermon's gonna get good here in a second, but we've gotta, we've gotta get to the peak before we can really get into the, the roots of what I'm talking about. The woman at the well says this. He says, she goes, yeah, the Messiah, he's gonna come. Yeah, he's gonna be in the world that, that uh, you know, over there. Jesus, Jesus is talking to the woman at the well, and she says, you don't understand because you're one of us. You're one of the people that, in the world that I live in. Someday, somebody from the world that we watch will rise up and everything will be better, a hero. Clark Kent will find his phone booth someday. And she says it to Jesus. See, here, here's, here's what I'm trying to express. Here's what I'm trying to explain is that sometimes a God concept that God has put into us as people that says we are not enough on our own. We know that we are incapable on our own. God places that there and it's an important function of humanity to feel drawn to a God concept but in our humanity we, we misguide, we misdirect that and what started as a need for God becomes a flawed hero syndrome. We need a hero. See, what happened is it started off as a, a drawing towards a God that we know that somehow we need. And we go, but, but what, a hero. We need a person. Let me say it this way. Maybe this will help, help define because we're, we're getting close. We're getting close. I'll tell you when the sermon starts. Rather than a God that we serve, we have this tendency because we don't think of ourselves as being all that interesting. We don't think of ourselves as being all that important. We don't think of ourselves as ruling the whole world. We, we just want a leader. What? We don't want a God that we serve. We want a leader who will serve us. We want a hero who will show up on the scene, see our plight, and act in a way that benefits us. See, and a hero syndrome actually kind of feeds into our humanity more than a God concept that says, give up the things that you're, that you're clinging to and follow me. We've got to wrestle with this. We've got to wrestle with this. Why? Because there are advantages that are found only in, in moments of desperation. In moments where we feel the most desperate for us to understand this, we have to almost first feel desperation. You look at what happened in Numbers 14, and for the sake of time, I won't read it all to you, but the Egyptians, they were mad and they were grumbling and they were upset. Why? Because they need a hero and we thought it was gonna be Moses and Moses leads them out and they're like, all right, Moses, are you gonna do what we want? And Moses goes, no, I'm gonna do what God wants. And they're like, hmm, hmm, hmm. He said, this is verse three of Numbers 14. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, what? Listen, listen to this, ready? We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. They could, have they could have loaded up and walked back to Egypt. But in their minds, oh, we could never. We are the people who just live in the world that we live in. We need someone amazing. We need a hero. We need a hero. And what will that hero do? Whatever we tell him to do. See the, uh-oh, uh-oh. See, that's not a very good God concept. All right, God, you wanna be my God? What's your resume? We know that doesn't work. They said, we need the face, the face of the movement. We need the face of the movement. Who is the face of the movement of someone who will lead us back to where we wanna go? Find us a hero. We love it when there's a face. We are people who like, rather than grasping big concepts, we try to just boil it down to what's simple. For instance, if I said Apple, the company Apple, you're like, ah, Steve Jobs. Tesla, there you go. You're probably saying it out loud. How am I not? Who, what name do we think of? You can all say it out loud. What, what's the name that we all think of when I say Tesla? Elon Musk. What about Amazon? Jeff Bezos. Why, why do we do that? Why do we do that? Because you know these companies have engineers. We know that these companies have people who work. We know that these companies have janitors. We don't want to know the name of the janitor. Why don't we want to know the name of the janitor? Why? Why? Because the janitor is too much like us. The janitor isn't wealthy. He's not exciting. He's not this giant, larger-than-life figure. The janitor is too much like us. We want a hero. We want a face. These are just, what about this one? Rather than consider that our nation is facing a sin issue, 
that our nation has lost its way on things like morality and generosity and grace and mercy, rather than to consider that maybe our nation is starting to lose its moral compass a little bit, what do we say? George Soros. (laughs) It's just easier. It's just easier if we have one face and we can accredit or blame one thing. I probably just made some people mad. So when Philip shows up to Nathaniel, here's the thing. When Philip shows up to Nathaniel, we still haven't started the sermon. When Philip shows up to Nathaniel, he doesn't just say, I think I found the Messiah. What does he do? He tries to attach his opinion with a hero. What does he say? He says, Philip found Nathaniel and told him, we have found the one who Moses wrote about in the law. See, he tries to attach himself to a hero. There's this thing that we do. It's just human nature. If you're like, "Uh uh-oh, I do that. Everyone does that. Nathaniel struggled to grasp how a hero could emerge from such an ordinary place and from such ordinary people. Why? He was hoping for someone more like Moses. Nathaniel thought someday we'll have our own Moses, the hero. Moses, the hero. We love Moses because Moses is this larger than life figure. So Nathaniel says, I don't want Jesus, I want Moses. Moses was the hero that validated the concept to Nathaniel. Ready? Are you ready? This is where the sermon starts. We're starting now. You go, uh, bear with me. I know what I'm doing. Nathaniel wanted a hero like the one he'd grown up hearing about. He'd heard his whole life about the the feats of Moses. That's what we need. We need a hero. We need a president. We need an elected official. We need Superman. Shine the spotlight into the sky. We've got problems and we need somebody who can fix them. I'm gonna go to Exodus 3. I'm cutting out a lot for the sake of time because I just now started the sermon. The burning bush moment. Let's see where Moses, Moses the hero. Moses is a hero. Nathaniel, Philip, Moses, Moses, Moses. But when God called Moses, in the burning bush, and he tells him all the things that he wants to accomplish in his life and through his life and for the people of Israel. He says, now I'm sending you to the king of Egypt so that you can lead my people out of this country. Moses said this. This is the hero. This is the standard of hero held by the Israelites. But Moses said to God, I am nobody. Isn't that interesting? He goes, I'm too ordinary. You need somebody from the world that we watch. I'm someone who is from the world that we live in. I'm the guy at the gas station. I'm the guy that you run into at the grocery store. I'm too ordinary. I'm too common. I'm a nobody. This is the hero. He he didn't start as a hero. What did he start? Just this common person. I'm a nobody. How can I go to the king? Because the king is from the world that we watch. Egypt, the world that we watch. I'm just a regular old sheep farmer. I'm just too ordinary. I said the sermon is starting here. I hope you understand what we're seeing is that what we think of as being a hero is a sham. It's phony. It's false. It's not real. We put so much hope and so much blame and so much credit onto something that's not even real because when Moses, the hero, was called, he declared himself unworthy. And you'll do the same thing. If God wants to do something in your life and you haven't addressed a hero syndrome, you will disqualify yourself and go, I'm a nobody. Do you see it now? Here's the problem. When we, please catch this, please catch this. Lots of words I know, big concept, but if you'll you'll stick with me, I'll try to explain it. When we centralize power and we centralize hope and we put all of our faith onto the shoulders of one person, what we are also doing is we are stealing hope. We are stealing power, we are stealing faith from all of the other players on the board. When we place all of our hope onto the shoulders of one person, we have also stolen it from the person that we're standing next to. We are saying only one person can do something for us and it's not you. Do you see the danger of a hero syndrome? Not only does it put unfair expectations onto the shoulders of one person, it robs opportunity from those next to us. Ordinary people need not apply, right? We need a hero. This was the exact person Philip had referenced as a hero, saying, I'm a nobody. Church, I'm gonna tell you, be careful, because this even happens in churches. I remember when I first got up here, and I'm not pointing any fingers, I think this is absolutely a natural reaction to a new person in a new community. We started the church, and people go, well, I don't know what that guy says, but so-and-so from the internet says, 
if I heard it once, I, I, I ask Lacey, if I've heard it once, I've heard it a thousand times, that people would endeavor, they would make an effort to disqualify my voice using the voice of someone they would never meet and they never will know. They would take the voice of their hero, their, their religious hero, and they would take the voice of this religious hero and they would use it to try to destroy what we were doing right here in the community. It happened all the time. Because that's what a hero syndrome does. It's the trap. It's the trap. Because be careful. Because when you put too much focus on the church leader, you disable or silence or disqualify the calling that God has on your life. I used to say it all the time. If these people know so much about church, why wasn't the church here when I got here? <laughs> God could have used you. God could have used you. God could use you. God could use any of us. But the hero syndrome says, oh, I have no authority, only the authority that my hero gives me. See how flawed that God concept actually is? It's a trap. John chapter 9. Now we're in the sermon. John chapter 9. God heals an ordinary blind man. He doesn't go to the king's child to prove his power. He doesn't go to this high-ranking official. He goes to one of the bottom of the social barrel, and he heals him. And this blind man goes, awesome. That's kind of what it is. Cool. And so the Pharisees, they call him in, and they go, how'd this happen? We're supposed to be the authority. And he goes, I, I, can't, I can't tell you. I don't know. They go, well, well, tell us your story. Isn't that funny? We want your opinion, but only if it validates our power. Isn't that what the hero syndrome says? We want your opinion so long as it validates our position. And he says, listen, I, I love this guy. He says, I don't know. Maybe you want to be one of his disciples too. That's why you're asking me all these questions. John chapter nine, don't miss what they say right here because right here they slip. The Pharisees slip. Whoop, they slip. They slip and they accidentally reveal the wizard behind the curtain, the heart that beats behind the curtain of a hero syndrome. You get to see it, and then they close it back up. You want it ready? Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We're disciples of Moses. There's Moses again, the hero, who said, I'm a nobody. See, they didn't actually care what Moses said. They just wanted all the power conjured by using Moses' name. That's the hero syndrome. It's always to rob people from their voices. It's always to rob people of their vision and their value and their worth and their power. You have nothing. Give it all to us because we're representatives of the hero. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. See, verse 30, the man said, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. What's this guy doing? He's going, I have a voice now. Why? Because I had an experience with who? God, not your hero. I had a God experience. If God does something in your life, you become empowered to speak about it, and a hero syndrome takes it away. God goes, you can speak. You have a voice. I want to do something in your life. And you're like, no, I live in the world that I live in. Use somebody in the world that I watch. And God goes, nonsense, nonsense. You speak. I did something in your life. I want to do something amazing in your life and in your circles. And we come to church and we go, oh, I don't speak. I just wait for the pastor to say something. You are voluntarily giving value away. Nobody's ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. Ready for this? Here's the slip. Here's the slip. The Pharisees, they're walking in their power and they slip a little bit and their, their robe falls open. You're like, you're not who you say you are. That's three people stacked into one. Have you ever seen little rascals when the three kids walk into the bank and they're trying to get a loan? That's what we see. We see a moment of like, you're not tall at all. You're just a stack up of little people. <laughs> Ready? Ready? They said this. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? What'd they say? We want a hero. And when we find him, he'll take away your power and your voice and your testimony and your witness. And all that the hero wants from his minions is compliance. See, if you look for a hero, what you're going to find is not a hero that serves you. You're going to find a hero that rules over you. Be careful, people, at how quickly the search for a hero turns into a power grab from the masses. It says that when you think of yourself in two worlds, oh, I'm just in the world that I live in. I'm not like those people in the world that I watch. I can't even dunk a basketball. It says that you disqualify yourself and the world disqualifies you also. 
Ready? Sermon's starting. Here we go. Mark chapter 12, verse 41. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put only two very small copper coins, about a penny, worth a few cents. Nobody saw it. This lady was a nobody in a world of nobodies. This lady was invisible. She didn't draw attention to it. How could you? How could you? I don't want to draw attention to what I do. I'm giving everything I got, but I still know it's not enough. She's watching and watching and watching large amount, large amount, large amount. Don't you think it crossed her mind to go, why, why do I even bother? This doesn't make any difference. Those are the people from the world that I watch, but this is nothing from the world of people where I live. She didn't draw attention to it. The Pharisees sure wouldn't have. Why? Why would you celebrate somebody giving not very much money if your point is to raise more money? So the Pharisees didn't point it out. This lady was lost in a sea of faces. You ever feel that way? You ever feel like you're just painfully ordinary? You're just as ordinary as it gets. You're not everything that we're told needs to be special, to be important, to be a leader. You have none of the qualifying factors. You are at a what? A what? A desperate disadvantage. You ever feel that way? You ever feel like nobody sees me? There's a world where things happen, and then there's the world where I live. She's from the wrong class. She has no money. She was the wrong gender. Women had no power in that point. And she was a widow. She had no representation. She literally had nothing, and what she did have, she gave away. Now, he didn't condemn the people that were given large amounts. And everybody's like, oh, see, rich. That's not what it's saying. Everybody's like, oh, look, look, look. Jesus wants you to give everything that you've got. Well, what it actually says is this. Don't you, think, don't you think that because of how Jesus was raised, remember they said, Jesus, how can anybody special come from there? Don't you think that because of how he'd been raised, because of the people that he'd been raised around, because of his childhood, because of his family, because he was, he was a member of the world that we live in, the ordinary people that you run into all the time that are just so unextraordinary. Don't you think that when he saw this lady that everybody declared ordinary that Jesus saw something familiar? The world saw somebody ordinary and Jesus went, that's my people. That's where I'm from. I've seen people give two pennies before. I've seen my family go to the temple and be taken advantage of because they were poor that the world didn't even see her and Jesus saw nothing but her. This hero syndrome that we've developed robs so much of our value in our life, in our everyday life. And it's like Jesus is going, wait a minute, wait a minute. And he draws attention to this lady. Calling the disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. She gave out of their, or they gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in everything she had to live on. What's he saying? What's he saying? Jesus says, I hold the whole, think of this. Jesus said, I hold the whole universe in the palm of my hand. Everything that is anything that's ever been created, I created with my voice. I hold it all in my hand. You think Jesus needs someone with extra talent to validate him? We call a hero somebody that does the extraordinary things off in the world that we watch. And Jesus goes, you want me to show you what a hero looks like? What voice is more important than the voice of the Messiah, the Son of God, God in human form? Jesus points to this lady in her ordinary surroundings and goes, that's what a hero looks like. And guess what? She lives right next to you. She's the lady you pass every single day. She's the people that you pass in the grocery store. She's the people that you see at the post office. Heroes. Heroes. Jesus actually doesn't seem to suggest that there are two worlds at all. We see it as being two worlds, as there being a separation. Jesus says there's only one. There's only one. There is nothing but ordinary. (laughs) There's nothing but ordinary. We see talent as a defining factor amongst people. God sees us all in this little tiny, little, there's only one world. Look at those special people. You wanna know something about special people? They're fragile. Boy, are they fragile. The first time they face failure, they're devastated. Ordinary people, we're like, we face failure all the time. 
<laughs> they said that after, there's a famous golfer, I won't say his name, uh, but we all know the story, it's Tiger Woods. They said that that was one of his biggest hurdles, is that when he faced public shame and humiliation and failure, his psyche was damaged. Have you watched the Houston Astros this year after getting caught cheating? Sometimes people that are really talented and really advantaged, they face shame and failure and they never recover. Because what we see as special and extraordinary, God's like, they're really fragile, be careful with them. You salt of the earth, ditch diggers, nothing's gonna knock you off your rails. That's an extraordinary talent. That's an extraordinary advantage. Why? It was found in desperation. You have faced desperation. You have faced failure. You have faced disappointment. And you didn't hold yourself in such high regard. You're not so proud that in your moment of desperation that you'll turn to me. And that is your advantage. That is your advantage, is that God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things only when we are dependent on him. That's our advantage. Our advantage is who? Jesus. Getting ahead of myself. Let's go back to Exodus. Moses is an ordinary person. Moses says, I'm a nobody. How am I gonna do it? Verse 12, God answered, I'll be with you. God goes, oh, no, no, no. (laughs) I don't need somebody who's extraordinary to do something extraordinary. I just need somebody who's willing. I just need somebody who will say yes to me because when you reach that place of desperation and you go, I can't do this, clouds just roll away, the sun comes out, the sky turns blue, and God goes, you just found your advantage. You just found it. See, a hero center goes, oh, no, I can't, oh, no. Which, by the way, is a form of pride, different conversation. Oh, I can't, I'm not, I don't, I didn't, I'm not. When somebody goes, I've got nothing, I've got nothing but God, God goes, you found it. See, that, true, that truth is true for everybody, but it's hard to find if you think you're advantaged, if you think you can do it, if you think you can handle it. Here we go. Almost wrapped up. We're almost done. After the resurrection, um, man, can you imagine? It just felt like devastation. The legs have been taken out from ever, under everybody. Everybody's in shock, and everybody's just kind of like trying to take in what had happened, and the resurrection takes place, but the news hadn't quite gotten out, and everybody's kind of, uh, uh, you know. Three years previous, Philip had come to Nathaniel and gone, I think this is the guy that our hero talked about. I think this might be him. Three years later, at the beginning of his ministry, Philip and Nathaniel, now we're towards the end of his physical earthly ministry. And it says that Jesus is walking with people that are just distraught. They're just devastated. They are at the height of their desperation and they're walking and Jesus goes, shows up. They don't recognize him. Jesus shows up and goes, hey, how are you guys doing? And they're like, How do you not know? We're devastated. We're destroyed. Life is over. And Jesus goes, (laughs) you think Jesus wasn't lighthearted? You think Jesus wasn't this fun, engaging, one of the guys kind of a personality? He goes, why? Like we had a hero. We had a hero and he was gonna gonna make the whole world better and he was gonna fix everything and he was gonna be our hero and... It didn't work. Verse 25, this is Luke chapter 24, if you wanna look it up. Verse 25, then Jesus asked the two disciples, why can't you understand? How can you be so slow to believe that all, what all the prophets said, all that the prophets said? They go, what? What's that now? Moses, he's our hero. And Jesus goes, don't you understand that Moses was just a precursor? Don't you understand that Moses was a piece of the puzzle, but I'm the picture? Moses was a piece of the puzzle, but that whole puzzle was a picture of me. Don't you see this? Didn't you know that the Messiah would have to suffer before he was given his glory? Then, this is, this is it, this is it, this is it. Jesus, with these, with these two disciples, he goes, you ready? And they're like, oh, it's him, you know. He goes, look, 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 look. Do you remember when the Bible talked about David? Yeah, he was one of our heroes. David couldn't even do it. Remember when the Bible talked about Solomon, Abraham, Isaac? Jacob, all these, yeah, yeah, they were our heroes. Jesus goes, they were all puzzle pieces. Even they couldn't do it. They were not so heroic to accomplish what I had to accomplish. He says this, then, Jesus then explained everything written about himself in the scriptures, beginning with what? Remember, Philip goes, Nathaniel, we found him, the one that Moses and the prophets talked about. 
That's at the beginning. Now at the end, Jesus goes, written about himself in the scriptures, beginning with the law of Moses and the book of the prophets. Jesus goes, you had it right, but it wasn't a hero you were looking for. It was a savior. It was a savior. And even in those stories of people who couldn't do it, I was there. I was leading them. I was guiding them. I had them by the hand. They were ordinary, but they had me. That's what the story was. The story wasn't how extraordinary or how talented people are. Church, Shiloh, online, internet, in person, listen to this. It's not about how amazing or extraordinary you are. Because to be honest, probably not that much. But Jesus explained, I wasn't looking for the most talented, the most extraordinary. I was looking for the most willing. And if it's the most willing, that is in direct, direct connection to choice. Choice, not talent, choice. Jesus goes, I'm not looking for talent. I'm looking for choice. That means this. He, Jesus, was the hero of all of those stories. So if you're waiting to be the hero of your own story, spoiler alert, go read a comic book because that's where the heroes always get it right. Also, please don't be an adult who reads comic books. <laughs> okay. The Bible was not a story of heroes who got it right. The story of Jesus was told by people who chose to serve and to follow and to obey and to answer the calling, not in the world that we watch. Where? Where? Just like the woman with the two pennies. He calls us to make an impact and to choose to follow and to choose to lead in the world where we live. Do you realize how damaging that is to our political system if as a nation we said, we don't need a hero, we need accountability. We wanna believe that our choices matter. We wanna believe that when our desperation, when we do this, God does this that no matter how ordinary or how anonymous we feel, God is watching, going, watch, look, 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 look. That person is a hero. I can use that person. I can do amazing things in that person's life. They may never be known by the masses, but I'm gonna tell you this. When you walk through the doors of, he- of heaven, my, my guess, my supposition is this. It won't be the heroes that get the, <laughs> the welcome. It'll be that lady that you pass in the grocery store every day who believed that God could do amazing things in her life. There are advantages that are only found where? In our desperation. In our desperation where we go, God, I am just desperately ordinary. And if you're gonna do anything in my life, you're gonna have to do it. And Jesus goes, that's the kind of people I was raised around. Those are my people. That's my roots. He doesn't see ordinary, he sees familiar. Those are the people, it was the blue collar people that loved him, that cared for him, that fed him when he was a child, that fed Jesus in his dark years. You go, what are his dark years? The years that weren't even being documented. It was the familiar, it was the ordinary that loved Jesus before the world knew about him. He was raised and cultivated in the soil of ordinary people. We've got a unique aspect or a unique view into the heart of Jesus based in the fact that we are just blue collar, dirt under our fingernails, ordinary people, and God will use that to do extraordinary things. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you bring to mind the areas where we're looking for a hero, the areas where we try to centralize power and hope and faith optimism onto the shoulders of one person. God, help us to realize that that robs and that steals from the opportunity that we have as people. God, we don't need to centralize all of our hope on the shoulders of a hero. We need to look to you because you have said, through you, we become who you want us to be. God, we don't need a a hero who comes in and serves our needs and serves our wants and does what we ask. We need a God who says, lay down your will and follow me and you'll go places you couldn't have gone. Give us perspective. Give us depth. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
just want to go back to the bridge of this song. It just talks about there's nothing that Jesus wouldn't do to come after us. There's no shadow that he won't light up. There's no mountain he wouldn't climb up. There's wall, no wall he wouldn't kick down. No lie he wouldn't tear down. I just need to hear this over and over today. hear it over and over. So let's sing this together. There's no shadow. believe those words today wherever we are whatever situation we're facing God you will leave the 99 just to find the one God we can't earn your love we don't deserve your love but because you are love you give your love to us freely God your love is overwhelming we can't even fathom how big it is for us. And we're so grateful that it's never ending despite what we have done, despite what we're facing, it's never ending love. We thank you for your love, amen. Thank you guys for being here this yeah, week. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. And uh, of course, we'll see you next week. But in the meantime, if you guys want prayer this week, there are lots of different ways you can get it. So you can reach out through our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram. Um, you can email srccpray at gmail.com. Um, we would love to pray with you throughout the week. Of course, we have our, you know, our people here in studio on Sundays to hop into a room with, but um, even when it's not Sunday, reach out. We'd love to pray with you. Definitely. Yeah. And uh, we'll do this again in a week. We'll do this again in a week. So, so for now, love people around you mm -hmm. and bye for now. Bye. <laughs>